Um, so I'm going to read some scripture before we worship together. This is Psalm 96, 1 through 4. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. So thank you, Father, that you're so good. Thank you that you are so worthy of our praise. Thank you, Lord, that we can come together today and worship you. We invite you, we welcome you here. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll stand for worship. Just want to speak the name of Jesus. 
song is a little bit of an older one, it's called Ancient Words, and I just thought of it for this Sunday because we are going to continue in Ecclesiastes, um, just seeking wisdom from the Lord and um, learning from his word how to avoid the folly of this world. So let's sing this out and ask God to impart his wisdom to us from his word. Thank you. 
We don't know what today will bring. Hopefully this will be kind of controlled for the next half hour, but outside of this, when you leave here, you don't know what the day will bring. He's continued to hit this. We don't know our day of death. And while the structure of today's passage is where it gets a little more challenging later in Ecclesiastes, it's kind of loose and fluid. It's like he's here talking about this, and all of a sudden he's over here and he's talking about this. So try to stick with me. But the main idea this morning is that wisdom and folly are powerful. Choose wisely. We're going to break this down into three main sections. We're going to flip first that the life is unpredictable, unpredictable and that death is inevitable. We're going to look at uh, second, that wisdom is better than folly. And third, we will see that folly infects everything in life. So number one, life is unpredictable and death is inevitable. We're going to look at verses 11 and 12 in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. It says again, I saw that under the sun the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all. Life is unpredictable, period. Now, what he does here is he gives us five examples of things that you would be able to predict, that you could kind of bet your money on, and it would come to fruition, and it would, it would come true. But he says, even then, things don't always go according to plan. Let me give you some just recent examples. NC State should not have made it to the Final Four, if you followed March Madness basketball. They were not picked to go that far into that tournament. Nobody picked Tom Brady to win his first Super Bowl. Now, of course, everybody picked him to win the, the last couple of Super Bowls that he won, but the first one, it was like, who's this kid who's coming in? And he won the Super Bowl. Nobody put, would have put money on David beating Goliath. And so he's saying that in this short life, that our human ability and the probability is no guarantee of success in life. Just because you're the one that should get this doesn't mean that it's actually going to happen that way. Life is unpredictable, which is why he's told us back in chapter 3 that there's a time for everything under heaven. Hear this clearly, though. This does not, however, deny God's sovereignty. As Jesus followers, we do not believe in randomness. We don't believe in chance encounters. We believe in divine encounters, that God was over what took place and what happened. And we rest in the fact that we are in God's hands. Remember, kind of what we've been looking at is this whole time, Ecclesiastes is looking at the lens of the fallen world. But we have the advantage of the entirety of Scripture, and we know the full story, and as those in Christ, we get to look at it from the advantage of, man, God is over everything. I don't know what he's always doing. There's a lot of challenges and ups and downs, and I'm confused sometimes, but I trust in a God who's in control when I am not. Tells us in Ephesians 1.11, we know that God works all things according to the counsel of his will. So God is working. Whatever you're facing right now, God is working in that. And he's working according to the counsel of his will. And so from our perspective, though, there's still a problem. We still don't know necessarily what God is doing. And there's no way for us to predict what will happen to us in life. That can be frustrating. All right, you're in school, you're going for that degree, and you've got all these plans of how you're going to get that degree, but then you get out, and then you, you maybe you hit kind of closer to my age, and you're like, oh, no, I've never even used it, or I've never done this, right? There's just a lot of factors that we can't control, even though we make these plans. And this is exactly what he tells us, starting in verse 12. He says, for man does not know his time, like fish that are taken in an evil net, and like birds that are caught in a snare. So the children of man are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. So the preacher wants to illustrate his point by going to nature. And he gives two images. Fish caught in a net. So if you've ever been fishing, right, whether it's this way or, you know, you're, you're catching them in a net. And birds caught in a snare. He says they both get caught before they realize what is happening to them. Right? The fish is just going along his day. He's just like, this is a great day. The water's feeling nice. I'm with my family, the school of fish, and all of a sudden it's like, what was that? Like, I didn't see that thing that I just swam into, and it just took me up. Obviously, he would have gone the opposite direction had that happened. Well, the same thing happens to us in life. We're just going about our daily business, our daily routine, and waking up and brushing our teeth and leaving the house, going to work and school, doing all these things. And then sometimes something unpredictable happens, and these adversities that we face in life, they're inevitable. And they're often inescapable. And sometimes we don't realize we're like that fish just going right into that net because we don't see it coming. 
we don't see what's about to happen. And so in his mercy, what God tells us is to expect the unexpected. Now, we use that in the church world sometimes to be like, God's going to do big things, right? And that's true. That's a big God. And expect the unexpected. But also expect the unexpected in your life as you face trials and adversities and things that you weren't maybe expecting to go through. And so we should not be thrown off by these things. If your life is not going the way that you anticipated going, that should not surprise you. And that's what the author here would tell us. If you're walking through something, you thought, man, I thought as a Christ follower, I would never have to go through this. And I'd never have to go through these hardships. Well, in John 16, 33, I think that's why it's important for us to look at the entirety of Scripture. It says this, in this world, you will have trouble. So take heart. I have overcome the world. Bob Goff, it says, Jesus never promised to eliminate all the chaos from our lives. He said he'd bring meaning to them. I think we forget that sometimes. I watch people say, man, now that I'm following Jesus and I'm practicing his way and I'm in church, like, this is, this is amazing. And it is amazing. Don't mishear me. It's amazing. But then they go through the trial, that first trial as a new baby Christian, and it's like, I didn't expect that. And so then you kind of see one or two things happen. People lean into the community in Christ and getting through that. When they start to drift further and further away and go, well, I tried this just like I tried everything else, and it just doesn't seem to work. And so here it says specifically the trap of death is unavoidable. It's presumably the fish died. They got out of the water, and fish can't stay out of water too long if you didn't know that. And it's coming for you. Maybe when you least expect it, it will come for you as well. We know that we will die. Does everybody know that? No. Okay, we all know we'll die. So the question is not, will you die, but are you ready to die? He's talked about death a lot. I think he's trying to prepare us for death a lot. And so if you are a Christian, let me remind you, there's no one fear in death. Christ has already conquered death in the grave, and you will live forever in him. All right, that should be an amen. Amen. Okay, amen. Got it. But if you're not a Christian, what is your plan for death? The fact that you're still alive is evidence of God's mercy in your life. You've got time to make a plan. He's offered you salvation. Salvation is available in Him today. Brings me to number two. Wisdom is better than folly. I think at this point, as he describes it in Ecclesiastes, many would be tempted just to throw in the towel. Like, if it's all meaningless, if it's all vanity, what's the point? Like, I'm just throwing in the towel and give up. If it, if it doesn't matter either way, if we're just kind of left to fate and chance, what does it matter? The preacher, however, has a different response to us. He tells us to live wisely. Let's look at verse 13 through 15. I have also seen this example of wisdom under the sun, and it seems great to me. There was a little city with a few men in it. And a great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor wise man, and he, by his wisdom, delivered the city. Yet no one remembered that poor man. So we see a poor man here who's wise enough to save his city, but no one remembered him in the end, even though he did this great thing. And so the city essentially has no chance of survival, aside from this one man's wisdom. And because of his wisdom, the city is saved. Now, this, to help us kind of think, of, man, why was this guy remember? Well, think about, like, people do things all the time, including great things, and we don't necessarily remember them for past, you know, maybe a generation or a couple of generations. I mean, even think about, like, the products that we use every day. I bet most of you tell me who created the Apple products, but aside from that, like, did you use a toaster this morning? Who invented the toaster? Who invented your toaster? Or your refrigerator? Or whatever. Like, we forget these people who do some great things. And so people forget wise counsel. I don't remember who said this, but people are fickle and flame is feeding. But he says, wisdom is still better than the alternative, even though it will be forgotten. And so Kohelet exampled wisdom, or exemplified wisdom in these verses 13 through 15, and now he wants to prioritize wisdom as he continues on in verse 16. He says, but I say that wisdom is better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. The words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one dis sinner destroys much good. Now, fortunately, in the case that an example he gives of the poor man, he was able to get people to actually listen to him and listen to his wisdom. But as we know, unfortunately, that's not always the case. 
And, and so he tells us, his wisdom is better than might. You know, we might see someone who's strong and has might, but if someone who's wise, who might look frail and weak in our minds, is better than that person with might. And so here's one of his main points in this whole section. If we are wise, we will listen to wise counsel. Verse 17, he describes a loudmouth leader. We've always known, we all, we've all had that leader, right? Maybe a boss, maybe a coach, maybe a teacher. No offense to any teachers in the room. But the loudest person is not always, and oftentimes is not, the wisest person in the room. This is normally when someone just kind of throw their weight around. Right? Maybe they're maybe they're big and scary, or maybe maybe they're not. Maybe they're they're small, but they they try to use it to control their family, or maybe their workplace situation, or even their church. Right? The church is not immune to this, and, and it's like maybe if I just yell more and just kind of use my power and strength, I'll be the wisest person. And look, this is unhealthy. It's sinful, and it causes a lot of damage. This is where the whole idea. I think church. Not this is the only reason. This is one of the many aspects of what they call church hurt. And it's like, man, I had this abusive, narcissistic leader, and they yelled a lot. And it's like, that's not Jesus. That's not the church. You were just at a bad, unhealthy church with an unhealthy leader. You need to, you need to get to a healthy, a healthy church. And the preacher doesn't deny. He talks about there's not that there's time for a war, but he says that even when weapons are used, it's best somewhat best used by someone who listens to wise counsel. Right? You think about think about world leaders. <laughs> They've got access to weapons of mass destruction on any kind of any level. And we all agree, hopefully they're at least listening to the wise counsel before they have access to hit the button that's going to do whatever it is, right? That's very relevant to what's happening in our world just even right now, if you watch the news. It says that, that, that those who listen to wisdom is always better. It's always going to work out better in the end. And so how then should we live in this world in light of kind of what he's saying here? Well, first and foremost, we should give our life to Jesus. Like, if you don't hear anything else today, like, I want to make sure you hear that. Give your life to Jesus. That's the wisest thing you can do. We'll help you figure out the rest. That's that journey we talk about inviting you on. Give your life to Jesus. Submit to Jesus. Submit to his will. Trust in Jesus who's in control of all things in heaven and on earth. And we'll help navigate that for you. Philip Ryken says there's many wise things to do in uncertain times. I think these are all relevant for us. He says it's wise to be thankful regardless of what you are facing. It is wise to be content with the life that God has given you. It is wise to be prayerful as it reminds us who is in control. It is wise to be humble, allowing God to use us for his will. It is wise to be generous to, for kingdom work. It is wise to be faithful to Jesus and his bride, the church. It is wise to be hopeful in a God who knows the future. And so we may not know the times that are ahead, but we worship a Savior who does, and he will deliver us from all we can trust in him, rest in him, and know that he is working in all those times. Which brings me to number three. Now don't get too excited because I only have three points today and you're like, hey, this is going to be the shortest message I've ever preached. I actually have five things underneath this final. This final. <laughs> We're going to cover an entire chapter. It folly infects everything. We're going to look at chapter 10. You'll, you'll probably understand why as I start going through the verses. You're going to be like, Man, yeah, there's a reason he's going through this entire thing. And so as we continue into chapter 10, it's really difficult to arrange, but with the help of a couple of others, I've put it under five subject headings. And so the first one is that folly runs wisdom. We're going to look at verses 1 through 3 of chapter 10. Here's how it starts. Dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench. So a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. He's using an imagery here. That's so strong you can almost smell it. And it stinks. But his point is that a little bit of folly can ruin the whole thing. Our next verse is a favorite of political conservatives. It says, A wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. Huh? <laughs> Sorry, left-handers. The, the Bible generally... Treats the right side as the good side. I'm not going to ask who's left-handed in the room. <laughs> as do many cultures around the world. And many cultures around the world, right or wrong, I don't know if they got, I don't think they got this from the Bible, but it's like, this is the, this is the dirty hand and the, and, the, and, the, and the bad hand. But let's pull that back a little bit. All the left-handed people are like, I'm done. I'm out of here. <laughs> the right side represents strength and might. 
the left represents going in the wrong direction when our hearts go the wrong way. And so this is a good opportunity, regardless right or left-handed, for us to pause and ask, which direction am I going in life? Am I moving towards or away from temptation that wants to trip me up and evil? Am I moving towards discipleship to Jesus, or am I drifting away spiritually? (laughs) You see, a fool goes the wrong direction in life. And if you're looking for direction, then start. It talks about your heart, making sure that your heart's in the right place, so that you don't go the wrong direction. And he tells us in verse 3, he says, Even when the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense, and he says to everyone that he is a fool. So the picture we get here is someone who's walking on a road, and maybe maybe it's a path, and right, the path drops off a cliff or something, right? And, and everyone's trying to say, like, hey, stop, and the fool's like, I know what I'm doing. I got this. I know where I'm going. I'm gonna, and you're like, you're gonna, you're, you're, you're gonna end up in destruction here. But no one can get a word in it, you know, otherwise, because the fool knows best, and the fool's just gonna continue into destruction. So the takeaway here, don't be a fool. So if you're that co-worker, like, don't, don't be that co-worker. If you're that spouse, don't be that spouse. If you're that sibling, don't be that sibling. Like, don't be a fool. And he not only tells us how to avoid folly, but he also tells us how to respond to folly in the lives of others. That's our second subject. Okay? Is that folly infects leadership, verses 4 through 7. He says, if the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place for calmness. We'll lay great offenses to rest. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, as it were, an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in many high places, and the rich sit in a low place. I have seen slaves on horses and princes walking on the ground like slaves. This reminds me of a Mark Twain witticism. This says this. Suppose you were an idiot, and suppose you were a member of Congress, but I repeat myself. I'm getting really political today. It's it's the text. This may come across overly sarcastic. But essentially, this is what uh, the preacher is getting at here. This is what he has observed in this world. And so he's saying to us, I think, it's possible we put the wrong people in leadership. Have have we ever done that? Have you ever done that? And I think he's saying, too, that there are many foolish people in government. I think we can all agree on that. I I I don't care what side you're on. I think we can all go, you know what? Yeah. That's true. Now, as a pastor, hear this clearly. It is not my job to tell you or my place to say what's political leaders are wise and which one are not, which ones are foolish. And here's part of the reason why. Because some will do that. There are churches that will say this. Well, if you go back to verse 3, he actually tells us that the foolish ones are already, they'll tell everyone that they're a fool. So the, the foolish leaders that we put in government, they do a good enough job on their own telling you that they're a fool. So pastors like me don't have to tell you that they're foolish because they themselves won't shut their mouth. And they'll tell you that they are foolish. So it kind of makes it a little bit bit easier. Just safely say, I think we can all agree, there's foolish people in government. Number three, folly practically affects our daily life. So he's going to give us further encouragement on wise living when he tells us that folly is self-destructive. So this now brings a little bit more hope, maybe closer to us, right? If we're not in leadership or not necessarily in government. It says, he who digs a pit will fall into it, and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones is hurt by them, and he who splits logs is endangered by them. If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength. But wisdom helps one to succeed. If the serpent bites before it is charmed, there is no advantage to the charmer. He's saying our best efforts can be affected by foolishness. Now, these verses don't necessarily mean if you're building a well or if you're digging a hole that you will necessarily fall into it. I mean, we probably most of us have maybe, maybe not, but you know, I've had to help often build a dig a hole, I've never fallen into it. But he's saying there's a possibility if you dig a hole and you're acting foolish around it, kind of horsing around, is what they would say to me when I was a boy, then you're more likely to actually fall into the hole that you just and we see this more clearly in 10 and 11, that working without wisdom will not bring success. That's why I give this example. Right? If, you're, if you're 
if you're cutting wood or, or even cutting grass this time of year when it's not dumping rain on us like it has this week, like you got to sharpen those blades eventually. Otherwise, you're, you're kind of working against yourself and you're having to work double time in order to use the tool that you have been given here. And so that's what he's saying to us is that you'll unnecessarily wear yourself out. Because you're working, you got to work even harder to maintain and to keep up. And at worst, you'll get bit by a snake. Now, I don't know fully what he means there. It's likely a metaphor, but regardless, it's bad. I have a fear of snakes. And I'm so thankful. I know we have like little, like, not poisonous or like barely snakes here in this area, but where I grew up, there's copperheads and things. So anytime my parents send me a picture of a snake, I tell them, thank you for the reminder that I'm never moving back to North Carolina because of the snakes that I have a, a fear of. But it's a metaphor, but regardless, it's bad, right? I don't think any of us want to get bit by a snake. And so what he's telling us here is we need wisdom in practical, everyday situations. Specifically, we need wisdom from God. You see, Jesus knew the difference between wisdom and folly. And he also believed there was a difference between life and death. And that that was a difference between wisdom and folly. He tells us in Matthew that the wise man built his house upon a rock. The foolish man built his house upon sand. The wise person hears the words of Jesus and does them. The fool does not listen or obey the word of God. Now, I want to say this carefully. I'm not thinking of any of them in the room. So that's kind of like a caveat to this. But it's possible to sit in church for a very long time, to hear scripture, to read scripture, to even quote scripture, but to not actually be listening to it and not actually obeying it. And according to this, what it's saying is that that is a foolish person. You might have the appearance of someone who's following Jesus in some way. They're not, actually. Because they're listening it, but they're not obeying it. And so if we are wise, we will build our house on the solid rock of Jesus and his word. Brings me to my fourth subject. Folly affects our speech and our words. Charles Spurgeon said, The doorstep to the temple of wisdom is the knowledge of our own ignorance. I think Ecclesiastes invites us into this temple of divine wisdom. In verse 12, it says, The words... Of a wise man's mouth win him favor. But the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is evil madness. A fool multiplies words, though no man knows what it is to be. And who can tell him what will be after him? The toil of a fool wearies him, for he does not know the way to the city. And so while the preacher begins his comparison with wisdom and folly, his focus in this section is how folly mixed with words is a recipe for disaster. If folly characterizes your words, you will find yourself trapped and consumed by your words. Fools use foolish talk. Fools talk too much. Fools are opinionated. Fools don't know when to shut up. So he says to avoid this, to avoid evil, to avoid the presumption, to avoid the self-destruction that foolishness brings to you, we need to choose our words carefully. We need to choose our words wisely. Paul Tripp says, winning the war of words involves choosing our words carefully. It's not just about the words we say, but also about the words we choose not to say. Winning the way is about being prepared to say the right thing at the right moment, exercising self-control. It is refusing to let our talk be driven by passion and personal desire, but communicating instead with God's purpose in view. It is exercising the faith necessary to be part of what God is doing at that moment. And now... Helen wants to bring it all together in our final subject heading that folly affects all of life. Verses 16 through 20. It says, Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child and your princess feast in the morning. Happy are you, O land, when your king is the son of, no, of the nobility and your princess feast at the proper time for strength and not Wise leaders lead their country to blessing rather than their own selfishness and self-destructive endeavors. And once again, it's obvious very quickly what type of leader somebody is. 
Sometimes we may not know that until, once again, they get into office, they get in that position, and then we recognize very quickly their pure motives. And he tells us here the foolish person is a lazy person, and that the results become clear. He gives us some memorable images there in verse, verse 18. He says, through sloth, the roof sinks in, and through indolence, the house leaks. <laughs> so in other words, the, you know, I mean, the, the house leaks. I mean, think about a roof right now, right? If you're sitting at home this weekend, once again, we got a lot of rain. Even from Portland, I feel like we got a lot of rain this weekend. I'm like, this is that last push to get us to the sun, I think. <laughs> but if you're sitting in your house, and you're just like reading a book or watch TV, and you're just like, well, there's some water leaking through, and like, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna leave that. Like, that's gonna continue to get worse and worse and worse until, you know, you're just sitting around and being lazy, saying it's not, it's not gonna go well for the lazy person. And then he contrasts the lazy person with the hard-working person. It says they have everything that they need. In verse 19, it says bread is made for laughter, and wine gladdens life, and money answers everything. Now he's told us some things about money before. So you hear that you're like, wait a minute, didn't he say before that that money doesn't do this? Well, we know that money has limitations. Right? We do all, we, we all realize that. So we trust in God, we don't trust in our money or our bank account. But practically speaking, if you have money, you're able to get the necessities in life, and you can enjoy certain pleasures. Money, if you have it though, I want you to hear this, it can also be used, and I would say as a Christ follower, it should be used for the advancement of the kingdom of God. Because if you do have money, it's a blessing from God, and it ain't your money anyway. And then you can use it. So you can support your local church. Yeah, I said it. Help, help the local church continue in its ministry, in its outreach, help it become sustainable. You can help support missions and missionaries. There's all types of endeavors and ministries and things that you can help support that are kingdom-minded to expand the advancement of God's kingdom. And so as a wise person, as a wise Christian, you will work hard enough. You won't be like the lazy man watching your roof leave, but you'll work hard enough to get the money that you need to provide for you and your family, your daily necessities. But then you also want to honor God by making advancements in investments in his kingdom. And finally, verse 20. It says, even in your thoughts, do not curse the king, nor in your bedroom curse the rich. For a bird of the air will carry your voice, or some winged creature tell the matter. This is an interesting chapter, isn't it? Started out telling us about dead flies, and now he's finishing up about birds carrying your voice. And so do not curse the king, in our case the president. Once again, if, if I'm not saying the current or the next or whatever, but if, if the person in that office is foolish, we will know. Because their own mouth will tell us that. But we're told not to curse. We're told to use our words honorably. And there's even a, it used to be, it's no longer there, but it used to be a Twitter reference in this verse. We talked about a little bird, and Twitter used to have the bird, now it's called X, but everyone still calls it Twitter. There was even a reference here, like, and, and kind of, be careful what you put on social media. Because sometimes we think that's safe, right? I'm not going to say this out loud, but I'm going to put this here. That's got me in a lot of trouble, because I thought Twitter was kind of the underground one, and I got called out for things that I've done there before. So um, I'm changing my Twitter handle so nobody tries to look me up today. <laughs> but he's saying, use wisdom in your words. Whether it's online, whether it's a text, whether it's an email. Just think about it. And we probably experience this on some level. It only takes one email. It only takes one text message. <laughs> that you send and you regret typing it or sending it. Because it's done great damage. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Has anyone ever run a friendship or relationship over a text? Over an email? I know they're putting things in where you can like still get back like a few minutes later. But you know, you're like, think about it before you send it. If you're like me, man, I will write up a nasty email or a text in the heat of a moment. I'll get my thumb to move it. Like, I copy, paste, send to Andrea, and then we'll explain to her to someone else, but you don't let her read it. It only takes one to ruin a relationship. Let's be people of wisdom. Let's ask God for wisdom. That's our, our flesh talk. We say, God, how would you have me respond? It's okay to be upset. It's okay to be angry. Look, okay, be honest, but God, how would you have me respond in wisdom in this moment? And so life is unpredictable. Death is inevitable. Wisdom is better than folly, and folly affects everything. So how do we respond to these truths? We go to Jesus. We look to Jesus. Jesus, the wise one. You see, Jesus is our righteousness that we could not be. Jesus is the exemplary of wisdom that we desire to be. And the wisest decision, again, that you can ever make is to follow Jesus. 
as your Lord and Savior of your life. Amen. Jesus never made one foolish decision. Like, that's someone who I want to follow and get behind. Jesus was the poor wise man who delivered people from disaster. Jesus went and died and rose from the dead. Think about the cross. The cross looks like foolishness to those who don't believe, does it not? But it's God's plan for salvation. That we would go through the cross in order to receive salvation. And that Jesus, our King, he made a way to have peace in this life in the midst of uncertainty. And if you've been following for any length of time, you probably understand that, right? There's this peace, even in the midst of chaos, that you don't understand because we can't have, we don't have the mind of the divine, but there's this peace in the middle of it all that God can bring upon our lives. And so what Jesus offers us is something more than eternal salvation. He does offer us that. But he also offers us a way of living in this world, in the here and now, that's marked by his wisdom. And that's what he's offering us today. Amen? Let me pray for us for response. God, we thank you for the entirety of your word. God, even on weeks like this where it's loose and fluid and it just doesn't make sense, at least aspects of it on the surface, but then we see the practicalities of the wisdom that is offered here. And God, we recognize that much of what's being described is life lived in a fallen world, but apart from you. But God, we're thankful that this book is not the last book in scripture, but that it continues on. And we know that you are reconciling and restoring all things back to yourself. And that you have offered us not only your salvation, but you've offered us a way of wisdom and living in this life. So we thank you for that. God, I pray for anyone in here who is on the fence between uncertainty of if you're real and following you, God, I pray that wisdom would push them to recognize and see the truth of who you are. Embrace you wisest decision they could ever make. And God, for us that, that who are following you, as we realize that we still deal with chaos and challenges and uncertainties and trials in this life, but that we continue to look to you, the author and perfecter of our faith, and trust in you as we continue on in this world. We love you, Lord. Amen. So as a way of, of response, we're going to do similar to what we did last week. We're we'll changing up just a little bit, but uh, the worship team is going to lead us in a couple of psalms and so take some time to reflect on the wisdom that Jesus offers us and the way to live in this world. And we're going to respond through the Lord's table. And so when you're ready, get out of your seat and you can grab the elements, the bread, the wine, and the juice, and you can take it back to your seat. And at the time when you're ready, you can respond and, and take that. So take some time to reflect first and talk with the Lord. See if there's any area of your life, maybe there's some unconfessed sin, an area of unrepentance that you want to get right with him first. Maybe there's someone else that you need to have a conversation with and be reconciled with them before you respond. So take the time. We don't have to rush through this as we transition into this time of response. We'll read this for us and then we'll transition to that. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he, he took a loaf of bread and after he blessed it, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said to them, this is my body which is broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. He also took a cup of wine, and after he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples. He said, this cup is the new covenant marked by the shedding of my blood. And for as often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you announce the Lord's death until he returns. And so we are announcing that Jesus Christ is the life that God has given to us. And as a sojourn, the table is open. Worship, uh, our, sorry, prayer will be available in the back. The time is yours.
church. 